My name is Sean Jensen, and uh, again, we're just so glad that you're here. Could you help us welcome everybody that's joining us online right now all over the place? Oh, man, I can't wait to share this word with you. That's on my heart. And uh, we're going to pick up. Let me just tell you some context. I think it's important to understand the, the time and the culture and what's happening when Jesus rose from the grave. And at this moment, Jesus has walked with his disciples for three years. He died at 33 years of age. They witnessed him die. And three days later, he got out of that grave. But he did not go to be with his father. He is now walking on earth for 40 days, revealing himself to a bunch of people. And here's why. So that there was eyewitness accounts so that we would still know about it in 2020. And so he revealed himself so people would write about it, and we have 5,000 manuscripts to this day talking about this man named Jesus who was fully God and fully man, and uh, lots of evidence to our faith. And so as he's revealing himself, there's one instance where some of his disciples, there was 10 of them, or maybe possibly more, and they were actually behind locked doors because they were scared of the mob that killed Jesus. And so while they're in there, Jesus just literally appears in the room. Like he doesn't use doors. He always makes a cool entrance. And so he appears into the room. And as he's there, they're like, oh, and he goes, peace be with you, because they think they see a ghost. And he reveals himself to them. The only issue was one of the disciples was not there, and his name was Thomas. Thomas is who we're going to talk about today. He was not at this moment, but he shows up Late to the party, I think he texted before the dinner party, said, you know what, guys, I just need some me time tonight, so I'm just going to miss out. And he missed out for sure. So this is where we take place in John 20, 24. It says, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. They're like, we saw him, Thomas. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hands into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. He said that because they were terrified. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound where they, they took the spear into my side when I was on the cross. He goes, don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Not my parents, Lord, and my parents, God. My Lord, my God. Not Pastor Sean's Lord and Pastor Sean's God. My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told them, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Without seeing me. Uh, just this past week, I saw something interesting. And what it was, was there's a new company who's actually um, starting a new program of toddler and infant skydiving. Um, and in case you missed what I said, I brought you some pictures. This is a couple of pictures. Now listen, based on where you are in here today, you're either laughing because this is absolutely hilarious. You're absolutely angry because what the heck are they thinking? Or you're just like bewildered at what I'm even showing you right now. And I get that. Uh, it didn't take long to realize that the guy who made it, it was AI graphics. This is actually a gag that he put online just for fun. And... Uh, What's funny is how many people actually believe this based on the comments. I, I brought some of my favorite comments. Here's one of my favorite. Wow, at that age, they won't remember. Terrible idea. <laughs> Thanks, Tina. Appreciate you. Right? There's another favorite one. Here's one. This one gets really deep. I've been skydiving and jumping out of the plane with all that wind hitting your face. Oh, weird flex, but okay. It's super hard to catch a breath. I don't understand how this would be easy for a toddler. I would definitely recommend the helmet. I thought my cheeks were going to fly off. Thanks, Ashley. Appreciate you. And my favorite, my personal favorite here, why are the adults wearing helmets and kids not? Which PJ Riley says, kids can regrow limbs and brains and skulls at the age, so no worries. <laughs> A troll like never before. Uh, what, I, what I love about the internet, have you guys, have you ever been skeptical before? Like, have you noticed how the internet age has really sped up skepticism in our culture? Like, it's hard to believe anything nowadays. We have the internet. We have catfishing. And, and not, not, not like what you're going to do later today. I'm talking about people who create fake social profiles so they can date people and they use pictures that aren't them until you find out, like, you've been talking to, like, an 80-year-old man and you thought it was, like, a 21-year-old, like, hunk, right? And if you're catfishing in here, you need to stop now. That's the word of the Lord for you today. <laughs> Uh, there's scripted TikTok reels, scripted Instagram reels, even news support and news this day and age. I mean, it, we have grown skeptical as a culture because who can we trust anymore, right? 
Uh, I've noticed that the older generation uh, believes everything they can hear most of the time. Not all of them. I'm saying I've seen that the older generation can believe everything they hear, and the younger generation believes nothing they hear. And there's this big gap. Uh, because of the skepticism, and honestly, it has filtered into faith, it has filtered into church, it has filtered into our basis and our faith in Christianity. Now, can I just tell you something? Before we give these people a hard time, our faith makes toddler skydiving look like a good idea. Think about this. We believe that there is a God who created, one God who created the heavens and the earth. And when he created the heavens and the earth, he decided to create man in his image, and he gave them a plan and a purpose but he gave them a choice and they chose to rebel against God. And because they rebelled and did not listen, the relationship began to deteriorate from the inside out. Because they did not listen, earth is deteriorating from the inside out because wherever sin is, death is. And things are breaking and falling apart and violence and hurt and pain. And But Jesus, God had a rescue plan from the beginning. He raises up a people group called Israel. And from Israel is this man named Jesus. Jesus steps onto the scene at 30, he gets baptized. People begin to see him. He's healing. He's preaching. He declares that he's going to die and rise again, just like the prophet said thousands of years before. And then I forgot to mention that he was born in the manger because his mom got impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Could you imagine being her husband? I'm telling you, Joseph, I promise it's God's. (laughs) And then he lives a sinless life. He claims to be God, but also man and He lives a sinless life. Why? Because we needed someone to die in our place because we could never do it. And so he takes our payment on the cross. That's Good Friday. But three days later, he lives again because without the grave, we would just have a dead person who claimed to be God on the cross. But because he got up, our sin can't keep us down. And we believe this to the core. Actually, there is overwhelming evidence to be seen when it comes to this faith. Skeptics all over are now believing in this truth the more they search it out. There's evidence everywhere, but you may be here and you're like my friend Thomas. Maybe you're here and you look a little bit like Thomas that we read about in John. You know, the one who came in and says, ah, uh, no, I'll believe it when I see it. Isn't that what Thomas said? Look at 2025. 20, he says, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hands into the wounds in his sides. The disciples like, we saw him, we, we touched him. We're telling you, 10 multiple people are telling Thomas, and he goes, eh, I'll believe it when I see it, which is kind of crazy when you think about Thomas, and maybe you're like Thomas Day. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like Thomas. I feel like his twin. I feel like I can doubt and be skeptical, but, but Thomas wasn't just a bystander people were trying to talk to about the faith. Thomas, listen to this. Three years prior to this moment was asked by Jesus to follow him. And he goes, okay. So he's following Jesus. He's seeing miracles Jesus is doing. He's being a partnering with Jesus in some of these miracles. They took a Lunchable and fed 5,000 people, and he got to distribute it. He's seeing it like, oh my gosh, we're not running out. He saw him walk on water. Jesus' best friend Lazarus was dead. He was in the grave for four days. They go out to the grave, and we know Thomas was with him based on dialogue that happened before, and Lazarus walks out of the grave. He literally has seen a resurrection. And the moment that his disciples say, hey, Jesus has risen from the grave, Jesus told his disciples this was going to happen. And Thomas says, "Mm, I'll believe it when I see it. Have you ever been like Thomas before? Actually, we give Thomas a bad rep. What about the rest of the disciples? They weren't at the grave with the welcome banner waiting for Jesus when he died and rose again. We find out they found out because they went to give him burial spices because his body was going to smell. And the ladies were there first. And the ladies preached and told him it's empty. So no one was even there after he rose from the grave. Yet here we are in 2023 celebrating that our king has risen. I think the word got out. But why do I say that today? Because maybe you're skeptical. And the reason we call this skeptical Easter is because we want to let you know, first and foremost, if you're here today and you're skeptical about all this and you don't know where you stand and you have doubts, I want to first tell you this. You're still welcome here. You're still welcome here. I don't know why, as Christians, we get so bent out of shape when people come in and ask questions, and they have doubts, and like, hey, I don't know if I believe it. Like, we're like, you got to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. You just got to believe, and yet you go and worry that God won't meet your needs. Let me, t- let me talk to the people who don't believe. 
uh, the word worry is the, is the phrase we adopted as Christians so we don't have to say doubt anymore. <laughs> we just say, I worry. No, but worry is doubt. You're doubting that God's actually going to fulfill and take care of your need. And so we have doubts, we have worries, we have these skeptical moments. And so we shouldn't be bent out of shape when people are coming into church and saying, I, I don't know, I don't know if I believe. I, I don't know if I should come listen. If you're skeptical today, you're welcome here. We're glad that you're here. I don't know if you caught this, but look at John 20, 26. Check this out. Eight days later, it says, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. I love this. The doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Don't miss this. It says eight days later. Later from what? Eight days later from the first comment when he said, I don't believe you. They said, we saw the Lord. He goes, nah, you didn't. No, you didn't. I, don't, I won't believe it until I see it. It says, eight days later, Thomas is with his group of guys, which shows me that his buddies didn't kick him out of the group for doubting. He was still welcome to the dinner party. He was still welcome to the table, even in his doubts. He was still welcome, even though he had questions. And I can't imagine what would have happened if they said, you know what? You don't believe us? Get out. We can't have that faithlessness in here. If they would have kicked him out, he would have never experienced Jesus on the eighth day. And I wonder how many people we've dismissed from church because of their doubts when they could have experienced the next day. Their, their next day, their, their moment could have been tomorrow. Their moment could have been on the other side of the questions. And they said, Thomas, bro, you can hang with us. You can, you can stay here. What I love is when Jesus sees Thomas the second time, what does he say? Peace be with you. Jesus offers peace to the skeptic. Jesus offers love to the skeptic. Jesus still shows up to the skeptic. He meets you where you are at. So I don't know where you are this morning. If you're in a dark place, a tough place, a good place, a doubting place, a skeptical place, no matter where we are at, what I love about Jesus is he can meet you right there. Whatever it looks like, he shows up and says, peace. I'm offering you peace. Because our church, hear me straightforward on this, our church is not just for people who believe in the resurrection. Our church is for people who are skeptical too. We're going to open our doors up to people who are skeptical about this whole thing. And we wanted to put our money where our mouth was. So actually next week, we are starting a four-week series called Skeptical Christianity. To show people like, hey, are you skeptical if the Bible is actually reliable? We're going to talk about it. Are you skeptical about faith when we live in a world of science, which isn't necessarily bad? We're going to talk about it. Are you skeptical about God's goodness in a world full of pain and suffering? If he's good, where is he? We're going to talk about it. If you're skeptical about the afterlife, guess what? We're going to talk about it. The next four weeks, I would encourage you, if you're skeptical, we have more evidence about this faith than I believe people even understand, and we're going to talk about it the next four weeks. And I'm going to encourage you, get back here if you're skeptical or doubting. And even if you're not, I believe it's going to solidify your faith even stronger to believe what you already profess. We want to invite you back. Skeptical Christianity starting next week. But if you are skeptical, you are welcome here, but I want to challenge you because this is important. Please hear me this next point. You got to keep searching. Don't stop searching. See, Thomas did not stop searching when he was in this idea, when he was still involved with the church. The very reason he was there eight days later was he was still with the group who knew about Jesus. He was still there. He was still searching. He was still looking. His statement said, I will believe when I see this. I'm asking questions. What was that day like? I can imagine him sitting around asking his disciples, like, what did it look like? Was he, what, what, what did he look like? Was he taller? Was he shorter? Did he still have the scar? What, what is it like? He was asking questions. He was still around. He was still searching. He was still searching for the answer. And I want to encourage you today that you would keep searching for the answer, just like, just like Thomas did. Now, here's the truth. You got to think about this, and this might get heavy for a second. <laughs> I'm sure the reason Thomas was searching is because if everything Jesus claimed to be true was true, I think he wanted to make sure because it would involve his eternity forever. And listen to me. If what we claim about Christianity and the claims Jesus made and Scripture says is true, wouldn't we want to search it out and make sure we're pretty sold on what's going on? Either way, either way ah, I'm going to reject it or accept it. Wouldn't you want to make sure 
that we claim that we are separated, every single person is separated because of our sin. And there's not, much, there's not enough good works, not enough church attendance, not enough giving, not enough things that we can do to get back on God's good side. That's not the way we get there. The only way we can be back in relationship with God is because there was a man named Jesus who came on this earth and stepped in front of our place. And he says, listen, I'm gonna die the cross on the cross that you deserve so you can live the life you don't deserve. And we get to live in grace with no guilt and no shame. He he stepped into our place and he says, an eternity with me starts now. Not just when you pass from this place, but now. We live in a culture who wants everyone to go to heaven, but we don't want to preach the gospel on how to get there. And it's by putting your faith in Christ. If this claim is true, wouldn't we want to know if we're skeptical if this is for sure true? Listen, if Dairy Queen told you that they're going to have free blizzards this Wednesday... I was like, hey, y'all, you didn't know this, but Dairy Queen's having free blizzards this Wednesday. You would be on social media right now trying to find a banner. You would be texting your friends, hey, did you hear about blizzards on Wednesday? You want to hang out? You would get in your car and do a drive-by on Wednesday to see how long the line is to make sure you're not missing out on a free blizzard. We would do that for some ice cream that satisfies for a moment. Why wouldn't we want to search for God's presence that satisfies for eternity? A peace we can't contain. A joy. Just search it out. I got no problem telling people to search it out. I thought of it this way. Uh, me, and my, me and my wife, I introduced you. We have three daughters, a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a two-year-old, y'all. Uh, and yeah, pray for me. I know. It's crazy. Uh, but they're amazing. They're great. And they've been in this, like, kick of, like, national treasure and, like, uh, scavenger hunts and hunting. We, we, we show them national treasure. Like, this is the best movie I've ever seen, Daddy. There's treasure. Like, this is awesome. And you remember that as a kid wanting to find a treasure map? You remember as a kid where you're like, oh my gosh, how cool would it be to find a treasure map and go on an adventure and figure out what this is? Maybe you still do that to this day, because I know I do. And so we actually were talking about this, and I devised a plan with my wife. We said, you know what, we should, we should, uh, we should do a, a scavenger hunt slash national treasure thing with the girls and not tell them. In our basement, we have this like section that cut out of our concrete wall, actually, that we found. And there's like it looks like a safe that gets pulled out. And y'all, I remember when I was like, we bought the house one year later. I, I stumbled upon this, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is my moment. <laughs> Y'all, I'm not even kidding. I was like, bring it home, John B. Bring it home. I was like, opening it. Your kids will get it. Don't worry. I'll bring it. I was like, opening it. And I'm like, I felt like it. I was like, I'm going to find it. There was nothing in there. However, we decided to burn like a little note and cut it up and put like a little like phrase on there. Like there was old owners, and we dropped it in there, and we took them down there, and they found the note. And when they found the note, they were like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And like our middle one's like, Avery, and Avery's like, Charlie. They're like, oh my gosh, we might find treasure. They're freaking out. And then we started something, but I don't think we were prepared. So we're like, oh crap. Like, <laughs> so we're like hiding books and hiding keys and like, oh, yeah, you know, and one led to a book that was hitting in our register. The book led to a key that was somewhere else. And every time they would get stuck on something, they would be looking through the Sherlock memoirs of the Sherlock Holmes book. They'd be like, Oh, you know, number page 452 on the third line. This is what it says. I'm like, all right, Nick Cage, go get him. Like, she's like looking at it. And then that led to questions. Daddy, what do you think about this? Daddy, what if this is the answer? Daddy, what about this? And they would look at the keys and they would ask questions and they would keep searching. And this turned in from one day to two days to, to three days and they would not leave us alone. It's like, where did we start? Every waking moment, it's like three in the morning. Dad, dad. I've been looking into that book. I'm like, go to sleep, y'all. How many people know that they were so excited because if that treasure was actually there, they wanted to make sure they could find out if it was there. And what if I told you that, what if there was treasure on the other side of your skepticism? And what if this treasure is a peace that this world can't give you? What if this treasure is a joy you've never experienced in trials before? What if this treasure is this idea of guilt and shame and everything you've done to this point has been washed by Jesus and everything he did on the cross. And not just that, a promise to inherit a place with no more pain and no more suffering. And for anyone else who put their faith in Christ, it will be, be reunited in heaven. What about this experience that you can have that you've heard people talk about and you've had experience? Well, I want to let you know that treasure is real. You should keep searching because I believe if you keep searching, you will find it. You will find, I have no problem telling people to keep searching. God said this. 
Let me give you this moment. There's this prophet named Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Israel is in Jerusalem. They have turned their heart away from God. They're doing their own thing, forgetting about how he's provided for them. And guess what happens? God leaves them to their own devices. And so the Babylonians, who are cruel people, literally stomp into Jerusalem. They ransack the temple. They destroy their worship place. They'd be like walking in here and just burning this place down. They go in there. They take all the husbands and wives and kids. They take them captive, and they begin to take them back to Babylon. And they feel like God's abandoned them. God, you fought for us. Where are you? It's a dark, it's a bleak place. No hope. Doubting God. Skeptical if he's even real. And how many people know God is so good that even when we find ourselves in the lowest of doubts, he still has a word to help us in those moments. That's what he does to the prophet Jeremiah. He gives him a word to speak to Israel. Listen, while they're heading to captivity. And this is the word that you probably read on a mug while you're drinking your coffee, but that's the context. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You will see, you, then you will call on me and come to pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. He goes, I know it looks bleak right now. I know you have questions right now. I know you don't know why your little child had leukemia. I don't know why you don't understand why this happened to the people you love. I know there's some pain and suffering in your life and you feel addicted and your upbringing wasn't good. I know that you have a bleak situation right now. But in Christ, I want to remind you, I still got plans for you. And they're not to harm you. They're to give you hope in the future. He is speaking this to bleak situations, not good situations. What I'm here to tell you is God has something better than the situation you're in right now. And many of us have experienced that. And so he says, pray and I'll listen even if you don't get an answer. and Seek me and you'll find me. You see, I have no problem telling people to seek after God because I have seen so many people who try to debunk God become to follow God. Those who try to debunk Christianity and the resurrection, they end up following Jesus because of the resurrection and the evidence. I'm telling you, search. Maybe you're here today because someone invited you. You're like, I don't know why I'm coming here today. Listen, you might be a skeptical here today. I want to tell you, I've been there. I am there. And I find myself as Thomas even in 2023. But Sean, you're pastoring a church. I have my doubts. But if I keep searching the heart of God in those doubts, he always proves himself to me. I got plans for you still, Sean. I got a future for you still. I got hope for you. And it's in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So can I encourage you to keep searching? That's what Thomas did. Listen, Thomas was doubting. He was not operating in unbelief. There's a difference. It's based on his statement. What did he say? I will believe when I see the scars in the wounds. See, doubt is I can't believe until I see this. Unbelief is, I won't believe even if I see this. And we live in a culture where it doesn't matter if truth hits you square in the face, people already made a decision, I ain't going to believe it. So if you're skeptical to hear, I want to tell you, doubt, listen, doubt leads to questions, unbelief leads to statements. Doubt leads to questions, unbelief leads to statements. So maybe you're here, you're saying, man, there's no such thing as Jesus. Jesus didn't rise from the grave. I hope that you have had, based on that statement, I hope that you have done your due diligence and asked enough questions and looked at evidence to be able to make that statement. Now, the Bible's unreliable. It's not trustworthy. It's all messed up. The discrepancies are everywhere. Listen, I know that's a bold statement, but I hope that you ask enough questions and you got enough evidence to be making that kind of statement. All the churches that's around to make us do whatever, be a big moral code and get our money. Listen, maybe some churches do that, but that's not the ultimate goal of the church. But if you've made that statement, I hope you've asked enough questions and you've looked into enough evidence to make that statement. We would never want someone else to make a statement about us before they actually investigate what's going on. And yet we have people who never investigate Christianity and what we believe, but they make some bold statements about the church and we lump everybody into it. Careful. Be careful before you make statements. Ask questions. Church, 2023 is a new time for the church because we got to get to the point. I'm talking to the church right now. If you're not a believer, we're so glad you're here, but I'm going to talk to the church right now. We got to be so comfortable in what we believe that we don't get offended when people mock what we believe. 
The fact that we are offended by it shows you don't really believe it as much as you thought you did. That's why Jesus had him proud to prove himself. He goes, I know who I am. You're like, oh, you're calling yourself the son of God? He goes, yeah, I spent time with him. You have no idea. You have no clue. You have no clue. But he didn't have to prove himself. Why? Because he knew without a shadow of a doubt. Don't get bent out of shape when people have questions. Don't get bent out of shape when people are skeptical. Why? Because I know what I saw. I know what God's done in my life. I know how he's changed my life. I know how he took me from depression to hope, anxiety to freedom. I've seen what he's done in my life. And listen, just like that treasure hunt, I want you to discover what I have discovered. Don't stop searching. He's out there and he's waiting for you to look for him. I promise you. It's great. It's great. The last thing is this too. If you are welcome here, don't stop searching. But hear me out. You can still experience Jesus too. You can still experience Jesus too. I know you may believe, oh, I got my doubts, so I may never experience him. No, no, no. You can experience Jesus as well. Can you imagine Thomas at the dinner party? Think about this, y'all. I have friends, and I'm a little bit of sarcastic. I'm a little sarcastic sometimes. Like, I like to troll people. Like, I play Call of Duty on my PS5 mainly just to troll people in the chats. <laughs> just like, I just say, Liz looks at me, she goes, are you doing this again? I'm like, I, I'm not telling anybody. I'm a pastor. I just drop in and I'm like, oh man, they like beat us. I'm like, you guys are terrible. And they're like, oh, no, no. and I'm just like, this is funny, right? Like, oh, by the way, if you want to watch this online, authentic, you know, anyway, so why do I say this? I say this because could you imagine Thomas hanging out with a bunch of his boys after he missed Jesus? I would be razzing them. Like, oh, hey, remember Thomas when we saw, oh, wait, you weren't there. Like, could you imagine at the dinner table, they're like, hey, you guys remember when Jesus showed up a week ago? And Thomas is like, no. They're like, oh, yeah, right, Thomas wasn't there. The thing is, is you have to realize that he was probably listening to the stories of the other disciples. We saw Jesus. He gave me hope. Everything that was spoken, not just by Jesus, but thousands of years of the prophet has been fulfilled. This changes everything. This world is not our ending place. Y'all, we're going to be with Jesus again. The moment they saw him, they realized, I know our best friend died, but this was the moment we realized when we die, we still get to see our best friend forever. Everything has changed. And they're like, Thomas, you got to believe this. And he goes, I just don't. And he's got to listen to this. He's got intense Romo right now. That's uh, regret of missing out. Uh, not to be compared with FOMO. He's already missed out. All right? So, and not the quarterback. Anyway, so he's having these moments where he's regretting it. He's regretting these things. And this is why it's so important. The one time he doesn't show up to church. Uh-oh. The one time, the one time he doesn't gather with the other believers. He misses a moment. Why I'm passionate about don't miss a Sunday. Don't miss a Sunday. He had to wait eight more days in doubt when he could have had freedom eight days prior. (laughs) He's hearing all these questions. He's hearing all these moments, and he's got to sit there. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're a student. Maybe you're a friend. Maybe someone invited you. You're a boyfriend, a husband, a wife. And maybe you're here, and you hear people saying, my goodness, I have been healed by Jesus. And you're like, yeah, I'm skeptical. And someone's like, I used to have depression and anxiety, and there's nothing wrong if you have that, and if you take medicine, some of us do that. God can heal through medicine, and he can use it. What I'm saying, though, is they've experienced Jesus. You're like, yeah, I'm skeptical. And they're like, man, I've experienced the presence and the power of God. Check out this moment when I prayed for something, and God answered, like, yeah, that's just a coincidence. I'm skeptical. You hear, here right now, it's like a dinner party where you hear everybody talking about their experience. And you're like Thomas saying, I haven't had my moment. I haven't experienced it. I I know that they're passionate about it, but I don't see that. When's my time? When am I going to experience it? You see, what I love about Jesus is eight days later, he reveals himself to Thomas. You keep searching like Thomas keeps searching. You keep asking questions. There's going to be a moment where your time comes to. And what I love about Jesus is how he shows up to Thomas. Have you caught this? Literally, he does the same exact thing that he did eight days prior. Thomas missed the experience of Jesus showing up behind locked doors and revealing himself. And Jesus is so good and loves Thomas so much, he gives him the same exact experience that his buddies had the week prior. So he can, doesn't miss a thing. He's like, I see you. I'm going to give you the same. Listen, I think about this. We celebrated one of our family members' birthdays a few months ago. And they shared the same birthday month as a lot of other people in our family. And I remember that we were lighting the candle 
and we're singing happy birthday for this one individual. And this one individual, we're singing like, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, and everyone's singing and we're enjoying it. And as soon as we said the end of the song, they blew out their candles and everyone cheered, yeah, and we just celebrated them. And I don't remember who it was, but someone got this bold idea. They grabbed the cake and they grabbed the lighter and they lit the candles again. And they started going, happy birthday to you. And we're all like, what is going on with you? <laughs> right? And, and they began to sing and we just started singing with them. And then they, they named another person who shared that same birthday month. And they came up and they blew out the candles. We're like, yeah! And then they lit it again. Happy birthday to you. We're like, who else is in here from this birthday month? And our relatives, we had like five or six people who shared everybody that month, and they just went through the whole line. They're like, happy birthday. And everyone there, even though it was for one individual, everyone got the same celebration, the same experience, the same moment as that one individual that we're there to celebrate. And maybe you're here today and you say, you know what? I know they've experienced joy. Jesus wants you to experience the same joy. I know that they've experienced peace. Jesus wants you to experience the same peace. I know they experience freedom. Jesus wants you to celebrate and experience the same thing that these other people have experienced in the church too. He's celebrating you. He, he wants you to know the peace that passes all understanding, the joy in the midst of the trials. He shows up and he does the same exact miracle for Thomas saying, I haven't thought of, I haven't forgot about you. Because listen, if God can do it in Pastor Sean, God can do it in anyone. He's got no favorites. I love this. Because the church just shows up to Thomas and says, Look at Thomas. He says, touch me, because he probably thought he was a ghost or hallucinating. And he says, no, I'm real. I got substance. This is real. Can I tell you that our faith has substance? And maybe you've heard something else on the news that they always pick that one crazy random person in the swamp that talks about our faith, and we're like, oh my gosh, what are they doing? But our faith has more substance than what people think. And so he touches Jesus, and he says, my Lord and my God, my Lord, my God. He sees Jesus. After eight weeks of being skeptical, he sees him. And scripture tells us in scripture that the church, those who follow Jesus, listen, we're the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Not the incarnation, which means we are Jesus, but we are the body of Christ. We make up his body. And I know Jesus isn't on planet earth anymore where you can touch his scars and do all this, but I can tell you one thing. You can search the body and you can see wounds that were healed by Jesus. You can see scars that were mended by Jesus. There are some wounds that were healed. There are some stories in this room. Listen, when Thomas said, I don't believe you, Thomas could argue their word all day, but he could not argue their experience. And we can argue about scripture all day, but you cannot argue our experience. We have seen him, Thomas. If you're skeptical today, it would be very, very good for you to start looking at people in this church and saying, what's your story? How has God shown himself to you? Begin to search the body of Christ as Thomas searched Jesus' body. And you'll find out real quick, I can argue scripture all day, but there's no denying that these people have experienced something I have never experienced and I want more of it. You can have that today. How did Jesus end? He says, Thomas, you believe because you've seen, but blessed are those who believe without seeing. You know what, maybe that's today. Maybe today you were skeptical, but now after hearing this message, you said, you know what? I think I wanna believe. I have my doubts, but I cannot hide the fact that there's something stirring in my heart right now. I cannot hide the fact that there is a God who loves me so much that he would send his son to die for me. Not just to die for my sin, but rise from the grave so that he could empower me to live a life of faithfulness. Maybe that's you here today. Maybe it might come during the Skeptical Christianity series. Maybe it might come in 12 weeks. But here's one thing I know. We live a life saying, when I see it, I'll believe it. When it comes to faith, it might need to be, I'll believe it, and then I'll see it. Because we walk by faith and not by sights.
If you put your trust in Jesus, he will never, ever, ever fail you. He'll never let you down. He'll show you he is worth the follow. So with eyes closed in this place, if you want to pray with me. Maybe you're here today. You said, Sean, I'm a little skeptical. I have my doubts and uh, my parents love Jesus. My friends love Jesus. And I see the excitement and the conviction. You know what? I'm going to take a leap of faith today. Right now, I'm separated from God because I have not believed in Jesus. I have not said the statement, my Lord and my God. But today, I'm going to make that statement. He's my Lord. He's my God. How do I do that? What must I do to be saved? How can I restore this relationship? Scripture says, believe that Jesus died and rose again and confess it with your mouth. So what we're going to do as a church, we're going to pray a prayer, which means we're going to confess it with our mouth, that he is the Son of God. And you get to do that with us. So with everyone the staying where they are in this moment, all squad members, everybody in this room, I want you to help me pray this prayer. But if you're here and you need to make a decision today, this is where Thomas sees Jesus. If you feel God stirring in your heart, pray this prayer in faith. It may take courage, but join in with us. You can say this. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus for me to heal my past and to give me a future. I might have my doubts, but I believe there was a man named Jesus who was God, and he died for me, and he rose again. I want freedom today. I want joy today. I want peace today. So today I choose to put my trust in you, Lord. My Lord. My God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you could look at me one more time before we head on to some announcements. If you pray that prayer today, scripture says all of heaven is rejoicing. Because the reason the church is still on this earth, the reason why we didn't go to heaven as soon as we followed Christ is because he needs us on this earth to tell others of his goodness. If you receive that goodness today, not only is heaven rejoicing, us as a church wants to celebrate you as well. Listen, I'm going to ask you to do something that might be a little uncomfortable, but I'm telling you it's going to be worth it. At the count of three, I'm going to ask you if you prayed that prayer for the first time, you said, that was me. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask you to raise your hand so that we can just clap and celebrate you. And while we're celebrating you, one of our ushers in the back, they have these gifts that they want to put in your hand. It's a Bible and some instruction to help you with your walk with Christ. If you're from around here, get into a Bible-believing church. If we're not your cup of tea, there's one down the street called Pontiac Bible. We love Pastor Jared. There's great churches in this community. If you're not from this area, find a church that you can believe who preaches the Bible. But at the count of three, if that's you, we want to lift up your hand. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he dies again. Three, if you made that statement of faith today, could you be bold and throw your hand up as high as possible? I see you. Keep your hand up until we get it. Come on, what's up? We got hands all over the place. Come on. Let's let them know. We, that's courage. Let's celebrate them. We got some up here, over here in the right. We got to get more bags. We got you. We see you. Hey, your past is over. Your future has begun. You can smile now. Jesus sees you. He sees you. Come on, church. Let's thank God one more time in this place.